Good to everybody, my name is Osgrod, and welcome back to Subnautica Explains. Now, this episode, we answer one very simple question. What happened after the Aurora crashed? It's been about three months since I last did one of these videos, so if you want to see more in the near future, let's see if we can reach 500 likes, and that will definitely secure um, another one to come in the very near future. So, to understand the entirety of this video and the time frame of which it takes place, and you need to know this. As the player falls to the planet 4546B in his life pod, a sheet of metal is torn off the wall due to the huge amounts of turbulence affecting the life pod as it plummets through the atmosphere. This sheet of metal bounces around the life pod for a few brief seconds before slamming into the face of the player at full speed. This knocks you out, leaving you unconscious for three hours. When you wake up, it feels like no time has passed at all as you receive various snippets of information from other survivors after fixing the communications relay. This video will explain what happens between the time of the player being knocked out in the life pod to them waking up three hours later with a very, very sore face. So we'll start with the life pods, their locations and the people in them. In life pod 2 there was Chief Technical Officer Yu and an unnamed technician. He landed deep down in the second blood kelp zone. Life pod 3 landed in the kelp forest containing crew but they were unnamed. Life pod 4 unfortunately landed in the crash zone and can be found floating upside down on the surface. It's possible that this life pod contained Captain Hollister but we'll get more into that later on. Life Pod 6 landed rather fortunately in the safe shallows, containing an unnamed crew member and a passenger. It can't have been that safe though, because both of them died of what was likely radiation poisoning. Life Pod 7 ended up in the grassy plateaus, containing two unnamed crew. Life Pod 12 contained Chief Medical Officer Danby, and it landed in the Koosh biome. Life Pod 13 landed in the mushroom forest and contained Mongolian emissary Jockey Kassar. This guy is very interesting, so we'll hear about him more further into the video. LifePod 17 again landed in the grassy plateaus with senior engineer Lafette, and LifePod 19 contained second officer Keen, and it landed in the sparse reef. So now you know each LifePod and its crew, we'll now look at each one closer and see what events unfolded for each pod. LifePod 2 contained CTOU and an unnamed technician. From the data entry found in their life pod in the blood kelp zone, it seems that they originally landed on the surface safely. However, the flotation devices failed and they began to sink. It seems that around 500 meters down, they managed to stop the sinking. They then decided to use their available resources to try and craft a rebreather and a dive reel to allow them to escape from their pod and get to the surface. It's possible that CTOU attempted to make it to the floating island after receiving Keen's broadcast, but we are unsure whether they made it or not. LifePod 3 and its two members seem to have made a successful landing. They pick up on the fact that their communications relay was offline, meaning they couldn't find a rendezvous signal so they could regroup the rest of the survivors. So instead, they decide to look for materials nearby to create a permanent habitat in order to survive for the possible years to come before rescue. It seems that due to the fact that no base seems to have been built, we can assume that they both died while scavenging for materials, perhaps killed by a stalker. LifePod 4 is an interesting one. The game contradicts itself here, so the writing may need editing, but from what we can tell at the moment, Captain Hollister was likely in LifePod 4. We think this because there's a PDA in there containing a passcode, possibly for his captain's quarters. However, the signal for the LifePod received by the player's communications relay describes how the LifePod made splashdown intact, but there are no life signs inside it and no crew members have disembarked. Is this simply a writing error or is it something different? Perhaps Hollister is dead inside the life pod, perhaps he was never in it. At the moment we cannot say for certain either way, and it is also possible that Hollister stayed in the Aurora as it went down, as a conversation can be found between Keen and him, where at the end there was a large explosion, presumably on the Aurora, and presumably killing Hollister. We do, however, know that Hollister is dead, as second officer Keen takes over control of the survivors due to the fact that Hollister told Keen that the survivors were now Keen's responsibility. This suggests that Hollister knew he was going to die, which reinforces the point that he may have stayed on the Aurora. LifePod 6 contained an Aurora passenger and a crew member. It seems that the two got into a disagreement over who should use the radiation suit to find help. The passenger doesn't seem to trust the crew member to not just save himself, so she takes it upon herself to take the radiation suit and go out without any prior knowledge of how to actually wear the damn thing. After a short while, the passenger returns, complaining of feeling sick. It turns out she's been contaminated with radiation due to the fact that she forgot to do a zip-up on the suit. She then proceeds to die, and then we can assume that the crew member also died later on at some point. LifePod 7 has a recording of a crew member trying to work out how to fix his seemingly broken fabricator. In an attempt to do this, he presses every button on it. We can assume he never got anything useful out of it, as he likely died shortly after. LifePod 12 contained Chief Medical Officer Danby, whose last recorded voice message was that he was plummeting towards the planet. A couple of explosions occur, he begins spinning, and then we can assume he died on impact. LifePod 13 contained Mongolian emissary Jockey Kasa. To get more background knowledge on this guy, you should go and watch my Degassi Explain video in which I talk about this fascinating character in more depth. But from what we can tell, Kazar was religious. 
The point of his journey on the Aurora was to locate and, if possible, rescue the crew of the Degassi, a small ship which crashed on the planet around 10 years prior to the Aurora. As he plummets towards the planet, he seems to be saying some sort of prayer, and even just before impact of the life pod on the planet, he was still chanting his prayer-like phrases. It's almost certain that he died on impact. LifePod 17 contains senior Aurora engineer Lafette. From his logs and SOS broadcasts, it seems that his pod was being surrounded by a dangerous creature of some kind, which is trying to get in. Lafette decides that his best chance of survival is to go out and scavenge for parts to reinforce the hull. This, of course, likely ended up in his gruesome demise, possibly by a bone shark, as he does mention that the eyes were green, and bone sharks have green eyes. The final life pod, 19, contained Second Officer Keen. We're not entirely sure what happened to the first officer, but we can presume he died before getting to a life pod. The way that kind of system works is if the captain is unable to take charge, if they're dead or injured, the command goes down the line to the first officer. If the first officer is unable to lead, then it goes to the second officer, which is what happened here. After being told by Hollister to set a rendezvous at the island, he likely made his way there, but we are unsure whether he survived the perilous journey or not. So overall, it seems that everyone died except the player without, within the three hours that we were unconscious for, and then that is where the story of Subnautica begins. So I hope you enjoyed watching the video, and hopefully it let you understand what actually happened a little bit better. So, thank you for watching. Ciao, my friends.